Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is you're watching this. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to edition 52 of Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, this is for the week of April, what is it, 12th to 18th, 2012. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for the next almost half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things important to me I think deserve your attention. Uh, as always, any comments, questions, reactions, whatever to the show uh, can be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And um, if you didn't catch that, you probably didn't, uh, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up here, somewhere around here, a couple times during the show, and uh, you can get the email address directly from there. Now, I have several things to talk about today. It's one of those days that, uh, that uh, one of those shows that I'm only going to be spending a couple of minutes on each thing, because there's a whole bunch I want to get through. But I'm going to start with some good news, or, um, well, you know, yeah, it's good news, because um, I always like to start with good news when I can. I actually mentioned this very briefly at the end of the show last week, threw in about one sentence about it. But I wanted to go back over it a little bit more because it's important. And so even though the news is like two weeks old now, I still wanted to go over it. I'm going to start from the fact that in 1990, there was an election in Burma. Uh, a political party called the National League for Democracy um, actually uh, overwhelmingly won those elections. They won about 59% uh, of the vote, won 89% of the seats. Well, the military actually blocked the parliament from, seat, uh, from sitting because they didn't like who won. This led to a continuation of the military dictatorship in Burma. The um, thing is, even before that election took place, the previous July, the general secretary of the National League for Democracy, or the NLD as it's known, had been put under house arrest by the military. Her name was Aung San Suu Kyi whose name I think I mangled last week, so I apologize for that, but uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. And she became one of the best-known political prisoners in the world as she spent 15 of the next 21 years under house arrest until she was finally released in the fall of 2010. Now, while she was in prison in 1990, she received the, RAF, uh, the RAFTO Prize, which is a human rights award. She also received the Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought, in 1991, she received the Nobel Peace Prize. In 1992, the government of India gave her, gave her the Jawaharlal Nehru uh, Award for International Understanding, and the government of Venezuela gave her International Simone Bolivar Award. In uh, 2007, Canada made her an honorary citizen, one of, at that point, only four people to have ever received that honor. And in 2011, after her release, she received the Wallenberg Medal. Now, the reason to bring all this up, in 2010, there was a national election in Burma, uh, and a new president was elected who's instituted political reforms in the country. As a result of those reforms, the NLD agreed to participate in the elections that took place just this past April 1st, just a couple of weeks ago. It was the first time in years that the NLD had taken part because they had said that the elections were shams. Well, it was an off-year election. Only 45 of the 664 seats in the two houses of parliament are actually up for grabs. The important thing here is that the NLD competed for 44 of those seats and won 43 of them. They won 43 out of 44 seats. And one of the ones they won will be occupied by Aung San Suu Kyi. Now, there's still only a small minority in parliament. Again, there, there, there are 43 seats out of 664. But their popularity can't be denied, and so their future importance can't be denied. Now, there's still a long way to go for Burma. There's still a long way to go. The military appoints fully a quarter of all of the members of both houses of parliament. And the military remains firmly in control of a country still racked by poverty. But there has been movement. There has been a change, and this is proof that change can happen. Change is possible. A year ago, you could be arrested for holding a photo of Aung San Suu Kyi. Now, she's in Parliament. And that is good news. All right, moving on from there to our uh, weekly feature, 
the outrage of the week. Uh, this week, we go back to one of our usual targets for outrage of the week, the state of Arizona. A month ago, I told you about a bill in the Arizona legislature that would authorize doctors to uh, withhold from pregnant patients information if they thought that information would prompt that woman to seek an abortion. In other words, it empowered doctors, in essence, to deliberately lie to their patients in order to prevent them from having an abortion. Uh, they could not be sued for malpractice as a result of this. It was just, no, they couldn't be. And if, even if the child is born with disabilities, born with birth defects, you can't sue the doctor on behalf of the child. That's specifically banned by the law, too. It basically freed the doctors, again, to lie to their patients to prevent abortions. Well, that bill was passed the afternoon of April 10th, Tuesday, April 10th. That same afternoon, the Arizona State Legislature also passed a bill to ban abortions after the 18th week of pregnancy, which is two weeks stricter than any other law in the country. Uh, and in fact, they redefined how you measure the start of pregnancy, which so it pushes back even further. Uh, the, um, this bill is clearly in violation of Roe v. Wade, first because it terminates a pregnancy before fetal viability, and second, because it contains no meaningful exception for the protection of the health of the mother. That same afternoon, Tuesday afternoon, the Arizona State Legislature also passed a bill that requires schools to teach students that in the case of an unwanted pregnancy, the acceptable choices are giving birth and keeping the child or giving birth and giving it up for adoption. That is, the state of Arizona is now requiring schools to teach students that you should never, ever, never have an abortion. These bills now go to Governor Jan Brewer, or Jan Brewery, uh, for, her, um, for her signature. And so the outrage of the week is the entire state of Arizona. All right, moving on from there. The war on women is not just about things like birth control and health, other health issues. It's an economic one as well. Um, the, the pay gap between men and women is persistent. It is real. Uh, it's not quite as bad as it used to be. Not quite as bad as it used to be. But the fact is, it is there and it continues to exist. Despite that, on Thursday, Thursday before Easter, with very little fanfare, very little notice, uh, Wisconsin Governor Scott Walk All Over You signed a bill repealing the state's Equal Pay Enforcement Act. Now, the law was passed in 2009, and what it did is it empowered uh, people who were the victims of pay discrimination in the workplace to file suit in state court instead of having to go to federal court. Now, the Equal Pay Law, you need to understand, was not just about women. It also offered protection from such discrimination based on race, age, disability, religion, sexual orientation, and some other things. But it was enacted largely because of that pay gap, that persistent pay gap uh, between men and women. Uh, at the time the bill was passed, Wisconsin ranked 36th in the country among states in terms of gender pay equity in the workplace. In the two years after that law was passed, the state improved to 24th place. Now, the law had strict requirements for bringing a case in state court. They were so strict that in those two years, not a single pay discrimination case was actually filed in state court. But the existence of the law prompted state employers, or I should say employers in the state, to be clear, uh, prompted employers in the state to, well, watch their step. But that's the problem, according to the bill's opponents. That is the problem. According to them, the very possibility of a lawsuit was an undue burden on business. This was too much of a burden for business. Um, said so the very threat of a lawsuit. Now, it seems to me that the best way to avoid a lawsuit for violating the Equal Pay Act is don't violate the Equal Pay Act. But not for these people, no, no. In fact, because they argue that the whole idea of pay discrimination is bogus. In fact, the bill's chief sponsor, 
who also, by the way, was a guy who last year introduced a bill that would label single parenthood as a contributing cause of child abuse. This guy actually argues that pay discrimination against women does not exist. Uh, it's, all because, it's all because women prefer child rearing to their careers. Well, the thing is, it's true that that explains some of the gap, but not nearly all of it. Uh, in 2007, there was a study done by the American Association of University Women. Uh, they discovered that college-educated women earned only 80% of what college-educated men did a year after graduation. Now, I'm going to quote the report here. After accounting for college major, occupation, industry, sector, hours worked, workplace flexibility, experience, educational attainment, enrollment status, GPA, institution selectivity, age, race, ethnicity, region, marital status, and number of children, a 5% difference still persisted that could not be explained. Even one year, there was already a gap. By 10 years in the workforce, that gap that could not be explained by any factors other than discrimination had swelled to 12%. Next week, April 17th, is what's called Equal Pay Day. This is the day uh, that women have to work, women who have to work from 2011 into 2012 to make as much as men did in 2011 alone. Pay, pay discrimination is real, it is serious, and in almost every state in the country, laws exist to allow people to pursue discrimination cases in state court. But not Wisconsin. Not anymore. Why is this, you know, you know, why is this happening? I have my opinion. Uh, Walk All Over You is facing a recall election in June. I think he expects to lose that election. And I think the reactionaries in the state legislature expect him to lose that election. And they're just trying to do as much damage as they possibly can before, before um, that actually happens. And uh, we're going to take a quick break. And we're back. I uh, got a bit of nostalgic news this week. Jack Trammell, the founder of Commodore International, he died about a week ago uh, at the age of 83. Now, why should you remember him? Why should anybody even know the name? Well, because of this. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, or rather was, then let me explain it to you. Trammell was born in Poland in 1928. Uh, he was a Jew, and during World War II, he and his family were imprisoned in concentration camps, including Auschwitz. After the war, he survived, obviously. After the war, he moved to Canada and then to the United States. He um, uh, started a typewriter repair business, which later developed into a company that made pocket calculators and finally computers. In 1977, he introduced the PET, the Personal Electronic Transactor. Uh, one person recently said that this computer looked like a 1990 point-of-sale cash register, which is actually a very good description of it. It was clunky, it was clumsy, it was slow, it didn't do a whole lot, but then again, very little short of mainframes did any better at that time. A couple of years later, he introduced the VIC-20, it was called, and then in 1982 came this the Commodore 64, so called because it had a whopping 64K of RAM. It was the first truly mass market home personal computer. It is the best, it was and remains the best selling personal computer of all time. The production ran for 10 years from 1982 to 1992. And during that time, something approaching 20 million of them were sold. In 1985, I bought my first computer. I wanted one to organize the newspaper clippings that were overrunning my filing cabinet. It was a Commodore 64. I love that machine. RIP, Jack. All right, moving on to um, all the technologically related news, but not quite as lighthearted as, uh, as nostalgia. 
There's a bill in Congress that's to be voted on during the week of April 23rd, which is being pitched as Cybersecurity Week. It is the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act, or CISPA, it is called. And this bill could obliterate any semblance of online privacy in the United States. What the bill's supposed intent is, is to prevent the theft of government property, uh, government information and intellectual property. But it could wind up letting your ISP block your access to the entire internet. Now that particular outcome is unlikely to happen. But the things that are more likely to happen aren't a whole lot better. The bill does one straightforward thing. It's, it's, it's a good thing, but it's not completely good for reasons I'll get into in a second. But what it does is that, well, you see, the NSA, the National Security Agency, they have what they call cyber threat indicators. These are technological uh, indicators that something is a cyber attack. The bill would allow the NSA to share that technological information with companies uh, who could also share it among each other. It could share with corporations and ISPs looking to secure their own computer networks. Now this, by the way, is, is why I say it's not an unalloyed good, because, well, considering what we've learned by people hacking into some of these corporate and government networks, you know, it's stuff we wouldn't have known otherwise. Of course, at the same time, you have to balance that against the risk to our things like credit card information and so on. So, you know, it's, it's an argument one way or the other. Um, the thing is that the corporations, again, that they could also share information among themselves. They could also sec share any security information with the government. There, so, which means there are real problems with this law. Now, one, it makes no effort to list any specific categories of cyber threat indicators that would be shared. Instead, it gives this incredibly broad, basically unlimited definition that says you can share any information um, that allows, company, it allows companies to share any information pertaining to the protection of a system or a network. Any information pertaining to the protection of a network or a system can be shared among companies and with the government. Now, the thing is, almost any digital communication could contain a threat. Networks routinely uh, uh, check, and, and check their data for the protection of their own networks. So what this bill would appear to allow is that all of that information could be shared with the government. What makes this really important is that at the same time it does that, this bill creates a sweeping cybersecurity exception to every federal and state law, including all privacy laws. This bill trumps everything, every law, every protection, every limitation. This allows, this bill allows uh, uh, private companies that are holding our personal communications and our personal information to share them with each other, with the NSA, with other defense and intelligence uh, uh, agencies, with other agencies of the federal government without limit. Because the thing is, once this information is shared, there is nothing to require it that, to remain related to cybersecurity. That is, once you have this information, you can use it for anything at all. Companies could use it for ad placements. The government could use it to investigate possible crimes without having to worry about icky things like search warrants and uh, reasonable, uh, reasonable doubt or a reasonable cause because you've already got the information in your hands. You don't need to go get it. And it also could enable a record to be kept of everything you look at, say, do, read, go to everything you do online could be recorded because our rights are being stripped away they're being stripped away and the only screeching we hear about loss of rights is about the right that is the least likely it is under the least threat which is your freaking guns no nobody is coming to take your guns away there are no black helicopters over your house nobody's going to be prying your gun from your cold dead fingers no but at the same time, our ability to vote, especially if you're poor or a minority or elderly, your ability to vote is being restricted. 
Our control of our own political future is being stripped away by the influence of corporations and the 1%. Our privacy is being stripped to the bone by government and corporations. Our rights and freedoms and our freedom of speech and assembly are being limited under all these claims of security. Almost any action we take, or, I'm sorry, almost any action taken against us becomes justified by the courts if it's done by cops. And yet the only one we hear screeching about is the one that is under the least threat. Hey, memo to everybody out there, including me, okay? Do you think maybe the amount of screeching and the lack of a threat might be connected All right, moving on from there to our occasional feature, everything you need to know. In this case, it's everything you need to know about income inequality in the United States in just two graphics. Now, I've talked a lot of times about um, how the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer and the rest of us are getting poorer too. In fact, just last week, I mentioned how the average CEO in the United States today makes a thousand times what the average worker does, and that as recently as 1970, it was only 40 times. Well, there's something called the Gini coefficient, G-I-N-I. -I. You can look it up. I've actually talked about this once before, some months ago. But there's a, the Gini coefficient is a measure of income inequality uh, in a society or in a country. Uh, it works out that if the coefficient is zero, it means that everybody has exactly the same amount of money. If the coefficient is one, it means that one person holds all the money. Now, obviously, no country is going to fit either of those descriptions. And in fact, the range is about from 0.23 for the most equal countries to about 0.70 for the least equal countries. Uh, okay, well, here, to show you this, here's, here's graph one. Okay, here's graphic one. This is a map showing the nations of the world identified by their Gini coefficient. Now, oh, the countries that are in gray, it means we don't have enough data to, uh, to make a decision. Now, I know this, this map is kind of confusing with all the different colors, so we're going to make it simple for you. I'm going to switch to another map, and that map has the nations of the world who have a worse distribution of income, whose distribution of income is more unequal, less fair than that of the United States, they're going to be in red. The nations of the world that have a better uh, distribution of income, a more equal, a fairer distribution of income are going to be shown in blue. Okay? Do it. And that is everything you need to know. All right, last thing for here. On April 6th, some five apparently randomly chosen black men were shot in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Three of them are dead. Police arrested two white suspects on Sunday and say they're investigating the possibility of whether or not this is a hate crime. Excuse me? Considering the possibility? Now, now see, all props to the police, okay? They acted quickly on tips that they got. They investigated thoroughly. They got these two guys, assuming they're the guilty ones. They got these two guys. But come on, considering the possibility that there was a racial motivation? Now, admittedly, one of these two guys may have just snapped. Um, apparently his father was killed about two years ago. And uh, a couple of months ago, his girlfriend committed suicide right in front of him, leaving him alone with their six-month-old baby to care for. So he, he may have just snapped. But it's also true that he described the man who killed his father as an effing N-word. And police are considering the possibility that there was a racial motive. Again, props to the cops for their, for their investigative work. But, come on, why is it so hard for us to face the reality of bigotry? It stares us in the face all the time. Uh, it stares us in the face everywhere we look. It stares at us in poverty figures. It stares at us in unemployment figures. It stares at us in repeated psychological tests that have shown uh, uh, discrimination in everything from hiring decisions to, uh, to everyday encounters. 
And we can see it, too, in hacked highway signs. And we can see it in open view. John Derbyshire is a right-wing writer, formerly of National Review. He recently wrote a particularly noxious screed about the talk he would have with his children about how you deal with black people. Among his bits of advice, beyond saying that the average black person is much less intelligent than the average white person, among his bits of advice were these. Avoid concentration of blacks not all known to you personally. Stay out of black neighborhoods. Do not attend events likely to draw a large number of blacks. If you're at such an event and the number of blacks increases, leave. Do not settle in a district or a municipality run uh, by black politicians. Do not act the good Samaritan to, to blacks in apparent distress on the streets or the highway. And if accosted by a strange black in the street, say something polite, but keep moving. Now, this was too much even for National Review. They fired him, okay? They fired him. But it still astonishes me that we can look at all that we've seen recently, all that we've experienced recently, and we still find it hard to just say, yes, this was about race. Now, that's about all the time that I have. I'm going to be talking more about this next week. Okay, I guarantee you I am. I'm also going to have some stuff about global warming next week, too. So two of my, two of my frequent topics are going to be back to those next week. But for now, I'm going to say uh, you just have the best week you possibly can. And, um, well, we'll see you next week.